this uh is this Donald Schumacher Osborne? <laughs> it is indeed. It looks and like we're climbing uh, on the North Slide, huh? We're gonna come down to the carousel at any moment. The, the Italian North Slide. Mi piace molto queste gare di salita. Sì, anch'io. If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. Please make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon to turn on your notifications, so that way you won't miss any of our widely varied video programs, including those with me and my friend Jay Leno. Also, follow us on Instagram at Audrain Auto Museum and Audrain Motorsport. So, Antonio, here we are off and running on the Millamilia, but before we get onto the road, let's go back to the pre-start. I mean, it's always great that the Millamilia starts with lunch. I mean, you're in Italy, so the most important thing is always to eat. And uh, especially I know that you, you like to eat at least 60 or 70 times in a day. I would say 80, Donald. <laughs> ah, the Millamilia definitely provides a challenge to the Antonio Meligari uh, eating scheme, but lunch before the Millamilia starts, at the Millamilia Museum, which is an amazing converted monastery, uh, an astonishing place that could only exist in Italy, with a great history of this amazing race, and, of course, just a few really interesting cars parked in the parking lot there for lunch. Yeah, it, uh, it, it wasn't so bad. You know, I enjoyed my prosciutto and my melone, which was great. And then um, I go out into the, the courtyard there, and there's a you know, casual, Jaguar D-Type, and um, they happen to pull out um, uh, 722 out of its, looks like it's Hot Wheels box that's right in front of the museum <laughs> there. Um, and then, you know, they happen to start it up, which was, which was nice. And then uh, it, it, it rolls off, and then everyone is crowded around the car, and everyone's taking pictures. I mean, it has such an incredible engine note to it. Um, Isn't it, that what the Millimillia is all about? I mean. We get to see yeah. historic cars yeah, in a lot of yeah. places, parked in museums, parked in car shows, but to see them on an unpaved parking lot and then to hear that straight eight start up, yeah. it just, just vibrates your chest. Well, what's so incredible about it is that you, you have, like you said, you have all these vehicles. Normally you would see them at a museum and they're perfectly clean, but Everyone is driving their cars to, to the museum and they're, they're dust and they're, they're, they're dusty and they're dirty already. And there's guys working on them doing final touches and they're, they're tuning them. It's like, it's almost like you went back in time and you were at the start of the, of the real race, <laughs> which is so cool to see all of the vehicles there in, in line and, and ready to go, which is awesome. And, uh, you know, going back to your eating habits and mine and the lunch, it's a really funny thing. Every time I've done the Millimilia, it's always been the same thing. I go to lunch, hoping to see lots of friends, looking at cars I hadn't quite seen and scrutineering, but I'm never hungry. I just can't eat. That was I'm not thinking, the same for me, Don. <laughs> I'm just thinking about what, what, what lies ahead of us. It's like, you know, I don't want to eat because I can't get into the car and think about spending seven or eight hours in the car and, and it's just... I'm just so eager. The anticipation is so high. I just want to get in the car and go. Well, it's very true because I don't even think you finished your, uh, your sandwich or your fruit cup, which I happen to <laughs> graciously eat. Ma come si dice in italiano? You can eat that? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, that was, that was funny. But yeah, I could definitely see the anticipation uh, pretty much amongst everyone. I mean, I was so new to it, so I was excited because I was looking at everyone and everything doing what they had to do. Um, you were more like, all right, come on, let's go, we got to get to the car. I'm staring at whatever car I was looking at at the time. Um, and then we, we get to the car and then we start driving to the start line and that's when, that's when I really started to have the, the realization that it was actually happening and it wasn't just a, a fun little tour to, to the museum. Well, I remember actually since we were supposed to have done this in 2020 and it didn't happen, I know that, that you did, frankly, I think what is a really smart thing. You kept thinking, yeah, okay, we're going to do this, but I'm not going to really convince myself that we're actually doing it until we're there. Yeah. And I'm not going to convince myself we're actually doing it until everything's confirmed and then that happened. And then we were on the plane and then we arrived in Italy. 
but we're there. I was just on an Italian vacation, you know, up until <laughs> the point where I had to had to start working. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and uh, work we began to do. But you know, this kind of work is work that's not really that tragic, is it? No, you know, it. it I was suffering a little bit, you know, but it wasn't too bad. Well, again, uh, as we said before, there's three jobs in the middle of million. There's the job of the driver, the job of the support mechanics, and the job of the navigator. And I would argue that the job of the navigator is, in many ways, the easiest and the most challenging. Um, the easiest, I think, because, as you pointed out before, the middle million route book is very well laid out. Oh, yeah, um, fantastic. Plus the route is perfectly signed. There's always people along the route to help out. You sort of know where you're going. But the fact that I actually looked in the book and I noticed that the route had been run and checked in February. We were in June. What could possibly have changed on the roads from February to June? Uh, <laughs> they added more roundabouts in Italy. <laughs> I don't think they could do that. Um, but it is uh, something that uh, these bulletins that they put out that uh, you have to study very, very, very carefully. And I think you looked at for the first time when we were in the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now that we're here, I could say I didn't really look at them too, too much. But uh, I mean, I think we were fine. It, I was a little rusty in the beginning for sure. But thankfully, the route is lined pretty well with signage and, and people will tell you if you're going the wrong way or not. And if you're following the rest of them and the crowds are cheering, then you're, you're most likely going the right way. And I have to also say that having been uh, a participant in many rallies here in the U.S., it is astonishing to me that across half of the country there were so few deviations in the route from February to June. Yeah. That was yeah. also a miracle. I think that the, uh, the organizers obviously have very good connections. Yes, they do. I mean, and, and the deviations weren't even that bad. I think it was only a page and a half, maybe 10 or 15 kilometers. So it wasn't a, a total loss when we had to look through the book. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't too, too bad. I definitely was feeling a little anxious when we came to that point where I had to mark it in the book. But once we got through it and then through the next days, it wasn't, it wasn't a huge deal to, to uh, check for that. And of course, the route that we took on this first day was a meaningful one for me because it was such a musical route. I mean, we left Brescia and we headed to Parma, but through Cremona, the home of the great violin makers, including obviously the great Stradivari. Cremona is a really neat city, lots of great museums. Is that a and sandwich? It's not a sandwich. Oh, okay, fact, right, never mind. Sorry, I was you're, thinking you're, about... You're, you're thinking of the Aida. Oh, okay, um, okay. Which is the next thing, because we also drove through Busetto. You're right, you're right. The uh, Sorry, first place I was thinking about Giuseppe food Verdi. again, Donald. Exactly. Um, and uh, that's also not a sandwich, but that's fine. Um, it's, it's food for the soul, Antonio. That's food right. Food for the soul. That's right. And, of course, the other great challenge for a navigator in an event like this is the fact that most of the cars that participate, and certainly ours, have speedometers and odometers that either don't work or have no actual relationship to the road below you. Yeah, well it was, it was definitely a balancing act because obviously my most important job was navigating and I had to, to mark um, the kilometers uh, of each uh, stop or, or turn or different direction in the book according to um, your phone which had the speedometer and the uh, kilometer marker on it. But then I also uh, was filming on the GoPros as well, and then also filming on uh, my own cell phone. And it was definitely a balancing act, for sure. <laughs> Keeping everything on my lap so it wouldn't fly through the car. Or I had definitely had a couple red alert moments where I didn't know if I could find a certain phone or not, but it was always lodged underneath my seat, which was probably like half an inch or less than half an inch to the floor. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was an experience for sure. We won't talk about the number of pens that you went through <laughs> during the the Millimilia. It was uh, twelve hundred miles and just about fourteen hundred pens, <laughs> I think. Uh, you know, I, I give myself credit. It was probably like thirteen ninety nine pens that I went through. Um, I remember I had one of them that was because I would always have my arm out the window, 
and I literally opened my hand a little bit and there the pen goes flying and I was like, oh geez, he's gonna kill me. And because you had your special pen and I remember you told me, if you use this pen and you lose this, you're not coming home, which was, which was pretty funny. But I didn't, I didn't lose that pen, fortunately. So. Then there was the, the wonderful moment which, which I thought, you know, a Hollywood screenwriter and a CGI effects person could never have created where you actually dropped the pen and it flew back into your hand. Oh, that was the best, because the, the wind came around and actually flew back into the car. That was like that was like someone telling me, all right, I'm giving you this chance not to lose the pen so we don't lose where we're going. But thankfully, when we would get to certain stops, um, I don't remember what town it was, but someone had handed us a bag, and in the bag was a pen with like the town crest on it and name. So I, I had that for about 20 minutes before I lost that one as well. It uh, meant that from there on after, we had to make sure that we paid attention to the gifts that we received when we arrived. Could be cheese, could be a pen, who knows. And so um, our first day was 289 and a half kilometers, about 180 miles uh, down the Viareggio. And uh, as we mentioned in the previous video, it's like an hour and 45 minute trip that uh, we took rather longer to do. And the average speed, of course, the Millimilia is a time speed distance rally. So the idea is that you do the distance in an average speed, and if you maintain that average speed, then you collect the least number of points, checking into all the checkpoints, and you look at it and you think, wow, okay, 180 miles and an average speed of 26 miles per hour, okay, where's, where, how difficult is this? Of course, it doesn't stop, it doesn't count stopping for gasoline, it doesn't count um, the fact that some of the roads you will go 15 miles per hour on, other roads you might go 40, um, but it was, uh, it's very interesting when you look at that, the average speed markings are very deceiving. Yes, and, and I think what I fell victim to was, I've been in the car for, at the most, maybe 10 hours, and I'm thinking, oh, this will be a walk in the park, but 10 hours on the highway in the United States, it's not like you're doing this on the Autostrada in Italy, I mean, the curviness of the roads, you're going through these mountain passes, you're going through cobblestone, you're going through dirt. I mean, it is all different kinds of terrain. Thankfully, it was sunny for, I think it only rained maybe on day three. And then for about 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. thankfully it was sunny the whole time and there was good visibility. But I can't imagine what it would have been like to have all that terrain if it was raining and it was foggy. I mean, that adds a whole nother element of concentration and being uh, careful I think I think we and more you obviously because you drove w uh, took it in the safe manner I think we, we were very safe about how we were driving but some of these people when uh, I remember the Jaguar a lot of Jaguar ah, SK120s yes. <laughs> would fly by us on these mountain passes into oncoming traffic and I think Italy is used to that. You see a lot of the people just kind of move over to the side of the road, but it's definitely an eye-opening experience to not have like a free-for-all, but some of these people are really racing it like they would have raced it back in, in the day. And it's, it's, uh, you definitely have to keep your, your, your reflexes ready for anything. You have to be alert and you also have to be prepared for what's coming. And I think that's one of the things that um, it is not a drive for people that like to drive distractedly. Um, it's definitely yeah. a part of the epic nature of the event, even as an historic rally. It still is an epic yeah. event. And you know, every day there was a climb up a mountain pass, and uh, this first day had a pass up a great uh, mountain pass, the Paso de la Chima, yeah. Um, yeah. which goes through the Apennine Mountains. And it's, it's a really interesting pass. It takes up to a, a little over 3,000 feet, um, which is terrific, uh, but it also is uh, one of the few passes on the Apennines that is open all year long. So no matter how bad it gets in the winter, this pass is still open. And uh, I have done a lot of millimillias in pouring rain and driving the passes in the dark, in the rain, is not quite the same as driving it uh, during the day. And uh, with this reverse route that they did this year, um, starting uh, from Brescia and going down to the west, down to Rome, to the, to the coast, was also interesting because I got to see a lot of the route that normally is either in the dark 
or you just have to fly through late in the day. Um, and so this is really great because it was middle of the day, uh, well, not middle of the day, it was sort of late afternoon yeah, we were like doing four it. four or five o'clock. Yeah, and uh, it was quite something. It was great to see uh, just recently that uh, Millamilia official uh, actually posted a picture on yeah. Instagram of us in the car yep. at the uh, chapel on the Pasa yeah. de la Chima, which is really, really cool. Yeah, that, that's a great photo. I think that was honestly my favorite part of the, of the first day because I had always heard stories that my dad would tell me about these great mountain passes close to home. And I remember seeing all you going through all the, the hairpin turns and the elevation changes and I was thinking to myself, man, I wish these roads were, were here in, in Rhode Island and I could take my motorcycle on them. Um, but I think, yeah, that was my favorite part. And what, what also was interesting to me was all of the other cars that would sneak in the route so they could take advantage of essentially the no speed limits. Um, when that uh, Ferrari 550 uh, race Pro car drive, yeah. came flying up behind us, I said to myself, whoa. I mean, that was really epic to see that car. I mean, you have our car from 1940, and then you have this race car from the what, early 2000s, 2002 exactly. or yeah. whatever. And we're both doing the same thing, and I thought that that was such a cool contrast of time. But through time, everyone just wants to be a race car driver, I think. It doesn't matter what time the car is from, and that was... That was a really nice thing to see both cars on the road for, I, that was like 20 minutes, I think. Exactly, nice. we ran together for a nice long period of time. And also, that pass and that section of the route the first day really showed what our car really could do and was built to do. Because, you know, again, we've talked about it before, yeah. power to weight ratio. Yeah. It's absolutely, power to weight ratio and aerodynamics. Yeah. You know, you yeah. don't think about sophisticated aerodynamics in a 1940 car. This car is actually designed in the wind tunnel and it was absolutely astonishing. Once you kept it on the throttle, it never slowed down. Yeah, I think you use the term momentum car. I exactly. Mean, it, once you got it up to, to speed, whatever speed that was, I mean, it would just hold the speed. And I was really amazed at how well the car handled. I mean, obviously you have brakes from 1940 and, right. and you don't have modern suspension and modern tires but the car held so well, and I think it did really well, especially in the mountain passes like you mentioned. I mean, obviously our car was, was older than a lot of the other cars, but we were running with oh, cars yeah. that were 10, 15 years older than us, no problem, just because of how much momentum we could carry into those turns, and that was really cool to witness. It is, uh, it is a really uh, great thing too. Plus, the whole aspect of the Millamilia being this great historical event and traveling on these legendary roads, the fact that that was the road on which Enzo Ferrari drove his first race in 1919. And, uh, and then I had a, had a, a panini in the passenger seat of our car. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it is uh, one of those things that, you know, only an event like the Millamilia can take you back to, to times like that uh, in, a, in a really uh, vivid way. And of course, um, as we mentioned in the last video as well, it was terrific that for us that the event was moved from its traditional May spot to June because we had later sunsets and uh, that really helped us out because by the time we got to Viareggio, the sun had just set a few minutes before. So we had almost no running in the dark. And then it was time to eat, which was the most important part because ah, I was ah, still ah, hungry by the end of it. Exactly. Yeah, we, we actually did work out a better scheme for the snacking in the car yes. as the event progressed yes. than we had in the first day. We did not have sufficient snacks. No, no. I mean, day. that was definitely my number one priority coming into to day two. Um, but when we got to the end, I didn't realize, and being that the first day was actually the slow day, right? I didn't realize how tired and, and warm and probably dehydrated I was. I mean, I, I remember I took a, a picture um, probably within the first hour, and you can see how happy and jovial and like ready to go I am and by the end of it how tired I was um, but I was definitely not prepared for for how tired I would have been especially when I had to get back and back up footage and, and everything else right uh, it wasn't as if you climb out of the car yeah. sort of dust yourself off yeah. have a nice meal and go to sleep yeah there's work to be done well another thing I think mentioning that I think we were very lucky to have a support crew I could not imagine doing racing the event and then having to 
tune the car at night and then get ready for the next day, I mean, you would get maybe two or three hours of sleep, if that. which is insane. Exactly, Honestly, yeah. Uh, Pietro and, and, and his, his guys just did a tremendous job. You know, we stopped the car at the end of the night. He said, uh, send me a text where the car is and I'll take care yeah. of it. Check the and they fluids, were there within sure. 20 minutes. I mean, exactly. Pretty, pretty remarkable service. Yes, we're, we're ready to, uh, to consider the, the next day, um, which would uh, take us off to Rome. Yes, yes, all roads lead to Rome, as they say. So. Exactly, especially the ones that, that we're on. <laughs> yeah, exactly.